2118, Chapter 1 The year was 2118. All in all, it was a good year. Hold on, I'm lying. It was a great year. An exceptional year. It's funny that I, of all people, should say that. Because as it happens, in 2118, I was also broken. So were my three best friends, my brothers in so much more than just in arms. We were all broken, and we all thought our brokenness was irreparable. As it would turn out, that was true for only one of us. Not for me, thank God. Me, I would be mended. Somehow, someday, sort of, I would be mended as much as you can be mended after war has entered your eyes and your brain and your bones and your lungs. War has a funny way of pervading your whole being and consume it bit by bit. Your whole body assimilates war until you no longer know where you end and where the war begins. When we came back to Earth in the summer of 2018, we all were war. We were blood and screams and rifles. We had won the actual conflict, or so the USA government kept telling us. We didn't feel victorious. However, we couldn't make the politicians understand that a soldier's war is never won. Our nightmares ruled us. Kenneth pretended like he was the exception among our small group of broken minds, but he wasn't fooling anyone, least of all me. I had known Kenneth since he was a ragged kid in a rundown neighborhood in Chicago. Sometimes I knew Kenneth better than I knew myself. I could see the nightmares raging, even by daylight behind his blue eyes. His once clear gaze held a veil, a fog that even I, his brother in everything but blood, didn't know how to fit. But I sure as hell was going to try. And so it was on our third week back from the war. I showed up unannounced on Kenneth's doorstep and dragged him into the outside world with me. Where are we going? He asked. He looked around nervously as I navigated Portland's traffic. Every time another floating capsule passed by us, he jumped a little, like he was expecting it to attack us. He also did it with obviously family-friendly Astro vehicles, like he expected 40-something soccer moms to come at us with a Kalashnikov. Someplace you love, I replied vaguely. Kenneth snorted, well, that doesn't really narrow it down, does it? I bit down on my tongue and forced myself to keep silent, because the thing was, it did narrow it down. It narrowed it down quite a bit. Kenneth used to love everything with an intensity that would have put the biggest aesthetics to shame. Since we had come back from the war, however, he seemed to either hate everything or fear it. Either way, the result was the same. He would hole up in his apartment for days at a time, and nobody would see him or hear him until he finally emerged from his refuge or we showed up at his door to make sure he was still with us. Except that he was no longer with us, not really, and we were determined to get him back. I took the long route for both of our benefits. Kenneth needed to stay out of the house for as long as possible, and as for me, well, I had been feeling an overwhelming urge to experience Earth as much as I possibly could. I needed to feel my planet, to breathe in it, to drink in the sights. I needed to reassure myself that what I had fought for, at least what I thought I had fought for, was still here, and that I really was home. I needed to know this wasn't some kind of cruel dream, and that I wouldn't wake up tomorrow to find myself in the middle of a bloodshed on the unforgiving surface of Neptune. Seriously, man, Kenneth spoke from a passenger seat as I steered the capsule over the Oregon forest. Where are we going? Just shut up and enjoy it, Kenneth, I snapped. Soak it in, brother. He snorted and mumbled something I decided I was better off not hearing. The ocean was gray and leaden beneath us. I rolled down the window and breathed cold, salty air. The woods were an endless expanse of green that rolled on for miles and miles. Humankind hasn't done much right, but at least we managed to stop global warming. Man isn't a particularly intelligent creature, all in all, but sometime, before my time, we came to our senses before we could finish frying our planet. At some point, we even came up with the courtesy of taking our wars elsewhere. Literally, back then, soldiers fought on other planets, uninhabited planets, 
that we felt free to treat as our temporary battlegrounds while we settled our disputes. When countries were at war, the troops would be transported to whatever planet selected for the occasion to sort it out amongst themselves. No civilians harmed, just a chessboard with human pawns. That's what Kenneth and I and the others did for a living. We helped governments play human chess. We were their champions. We fought and died so that others wouldn't have to get caught in the crossfire. Don't get me wrong. I was glad that no civilians were being killed. But as for us, well, in retrospect, it was dehumanizing. Sometimes I wonder if they even talked about us while we were fighting their wars. If they even mentioned us. If they thought about us at all. We didn't get it back then. Back then we simply fought because that's what we had been trained to do. We didn't ask too many questions. We found that it was easier to stay sane that way. But it took its toll. And you would never hear any of us deny it. The latest conflict in particular had done a number on all of us, so much so that the four of us together decided that we'd take a break before enrolling in whatever war would fire up next. Because it would fire up. Make no mistakes about it. It's what humankind does. We create wars. My friends and I weren't so delusional as to think we wouldn't see another conflict in our lifetimes. We were 28 years old and we'd already seen three. We bore no delusions for the future. I took a deep breath now, and I tried to focus on the gray of the ocean and the dark green of the trees, and on keeping the man sitting next to me as alive as I possibly could. Right then and there, I made it my decision to remind Kenneth how to breathe. I figured perhaps I could remind myself the same thing in the process. It was Josh's idea. Kenneth loved the theater. Over the past weeks, during those moments when he was completely unreachable to us and inaccessible to the world, we had sometimes caught him watching the whole The Hollow Crown collection on Green Ray. Those moments when centuries-old tragedies came alive on an ultra-modern screen were the only moments when Kenneth regained his spark. So, when the local theater set up a production of Shakespeare's Macbeth, Josh had us jump at a chance. Me... I was never particularly a fan of the stage. It freaked me out a bit, to be honest. It was easy to be sucked in when watching a story on a screen, easier to empathize with your own characters, and yet you did it from the safety of your own couch. The theater was just a little too raw, just a little too real for my likings, or not real enough. It was easier to sit through a mediocre movie and still somehow enjoy it. Not so with the theater. It was either a great play or a terrible play. There were no in-betweens. The lack of grays and the sharpness of the contrast intimidated me. When it came to theater, it was either black or white, and there were no in-betweens. The actors were untouchable, some kind of unworldly creatures that were all raw feelings and naked emotion. It wasn't that I didn't recognize the magic of theater. I recognized it a little too much, and it scared me half to death. The first thing I noticed when this particular play began in a crowded open roof theater under the July stars was that Josh had nailed it. Kenneth was coming alive right in front of us. His blue eyes sparkled. He sat on the edge of his seat in childlike trepidation. At times he even mouthed the words. I shared a wink and a satisfied look with Josh over Kenneth's shoulder and Nate surreptitiously high-fived me from the seat to my left. The second thing I noticed was Lady Macbeth. The production had gone with a younger cast, and this particular young woman was the stuff of dreams. She had the blackest hair I had ever seen, so black, in fact, that it shone with dark blue reflections when the light hit it at certain angles. I thought it must have been a wig, but later I would discover that it was very real. She had fair skin and a figure that something told me couldn't just be shaped by the corset of her costume. It was a toned slender figure that spoke of subtle, quick strength. Josh had got us with very good seats, and I was close enough to the stage I could see the details of her. I could see her big, amber-colored eyes. I could see the dimple on her left cheek. I could see her full and yet delicately shaped lips. She wore red lipstick for the play, and I remember thinking that I very much would have liked to kiss it off. The third thing I noticed was that this woman wasn't just beautiful. She was one hell of an actress, too. 
In a matter of seconds, I went from wondering about her to wondering about Lady Macbeth. I was completely transported, and for the first time, I wasn't scared. In fact, I wanted more, so much so that I was actually bummed when the two and a half hour play ended. The whole cast received a standing ovation, but she got the most roaring applause. I think I scraped my hands raw. I clapped so hard. I think we should go around. Nate spoke as we made our way through the crowd and out the open roof building. Wait for the cast to come out. I frowned. What the hell for? Josh smirked. Why, so you may talk to Lady Macbeth, of course. I actually felt myself blanch, and I was never so glad for the dim lights of the night. What are you guys babbling about? Kenneth laughed. Come on, you were watching drooling, I even noticed. I looked from one to the other. They seemed serious. I don't think that's a good idea, I ventured weakly. Why not? Kenneth asked. I shrugged. It just seemed sort of creepy, waiting for her outside the back door and all that. The guys looked at each other and then burst out laughing. Bastards. But they left it alone after that. That is, until she walked into the bar where we were having a few drinks. Just four guys out in the town for the first time in what felt like forever. I was enjoying the illusion that we may be normal young men. When she walked in with a few members of the cast and a couple of other people. I gulped, and I was grateful for the chance to cover my reaction with a drink. Kenneth elbowed me in the ribs, hard. Ow, I complained, shoving him away from me. What the hell, man? That's fate, he proclaimed, nodding towards the table where Lady Macbeth and the others were taking their seats. You have to go and talk to her now. Why? I could hear the whining in my voice. Because, he said, you don't turn down fate. I stared at Kenneth. His eyes were bright. His body was almost devoid of tension. He was gesturing animatedly. I sighed and resigned myself to the fact that there would be no way out of this one. Because you also don't turn down your best friend when he's finally coming alive after weeks of limbo. To be continued in Chapter 2. Thanks for joining us today, and I hope you enjoyed the story. This has been a production of shush.com. That's S-S-S-H dot com.